All right, friends, can we have your attention, please? So this is another data point for us. We still can't figure it out exactly. Sometimes when we say, can we have your attention, it's just instant. And sometimes it goes on and on. So we're doing, we got somebody who's doing a PhD in sociology here in the parish and they're using this for their uh, dissertation. So thank you for providing data. Okay, brothers and sisters, we're happy today to have reader Michael Marsh give our next lecture. The topic of our lecture series for the entire Lenten period is the Divine Liturgy. So if we could be attentive, because this is the most important divine service that we as a community celebrate together. We want to understand what is happening and why it is happening. And Michael is going to be here, is here to help us uh, to learn more. So without further ado, Michael, please take the microphone. Thank you, Father. All right, so today uh, today we're covering what's known as the Liturgy of the Word, or uh, Liturgy of the Catechumens, for, uh, called that way for reasons that we'll get into uh, shortly. But first, I thought it was a really good idea what Reader Dimitri did last week, and uh, quiz you all about what you heard last week. So um, last week we talked about the proscomedi, the preparation before uh, the liturgy, as most of us understand it, starts. So who remembers how many loaves and what they're used for, the priest used to prepare for the liturgy? Five. Very good, five. And do we remember what each of those loaves are? One of them is the lamb which will become the body of Christ. Anyone remember any of the others? Mother of God. Very good, Father. Mother of God. Somebody's yeah. nine ranks. Nine, yes, nine ranks of saints. We've got three. We've got three out of five. Anyone who's not clergy or clergy family? <laughs> Okay, after those, then they commemorate the living and the dead with the remaining two loaves. I was going to ask what the nine ranks of saints were, but I think given how we just did on that, we can... Uh... Yes, Father. The forerunner, the prophets, the apostles, the hierarchs, the, menace, the martyrs, the venerable ones, holy mercenaries, ancestors of God, the saints are Christians. Very good. Do I pass? Yes. Okay. A plus plus. <laughs> All right. So after uh, after the priest prepares those five loaves, as we just discussed at the um, proskomiti, we have. Do this is during the reading of the hours as you come into church. People are we're reading. People are getting ready, venerating the icons, lighting candles. We uh, start. Um, we start the liturgy of the word, which is the first part of the liturgy. Which traditionally, uh, catechumens were. Uh, this was the only part of the liturgy catechumens were allowed to attend. So, at the very beginning of the liturgy, the uh, priest standing before the altar, well lifts up the gospel book and proclaims, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever unto the ages of ages. We begin our worship with a profession of faith in the triune God, faith in the whole, because faith in the Holy Trinity is fundamental for all Christians. After the priest uh, proclaims the kingdom, the people or the choir respond with Amen, because we all need to affirm the Trinity. So, after that, the, uh, we have the deacon who, standing before the holy doors, symbolizes the angel that motivates us to pray, who begins the great litany. And how does the great litany begin? The deacon says, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. We must begin our prayer in peace because uh, without peace, prayer is impossible. 
So as the deacon goes through uh, each item of the uh, of the great actenia or great litany, as we've been calling it, we're led to pray for all those present, uh, for the hierarchy, for the civil authorities, for the good order of society, and so on and so forth. We uh, we also pray this litany uh, at the beginning of vespers and uh, the beginning of mass. Simeon's just sad that we're not praying right now. So after uh, after we finish the great litany, we start with the the antiphons, which uh, are so- selections from the psalm that we sing before the, the first entrance. And there's a few um, kind of like interpreting scripture. There's a few different. Uh, Meanings, meanings behind why we do the antiphons. Uh, the because the antiphons are the psalms, which many of which are prophetic. These are uh, prophetically proclaiming the co- coming of the Son of God into the world, like Saint John the Baptist did, uh, preparing us for what we're going to experience, what we're going to hear in uh, the epistle and gospel. The uh, as well as historically speaking, these. Uh, the first psalms that are sung at the beginning of the liturgy used to be sung uh, in Constantinople during a procession to the church until um, the uh, until all all the people at, entered the church uh, at the um, at the little entrance, which we'll cover in a minute. But the antiphons themselves could come in one of three different forms. We have the uh, daily antiphons, which we may not be that familiar with, but if you're in a monastery where they were serving liturgy every day, they would, um, those would be what they would sing during the weekdays. We have, and those are short psalm verses uh, to the Theotokos and to Christ. We have the festive antiphons, which are um, sung during a, during great feast of the Lord. And then we have, uh, what's called the typical antiphons, because these are what we typically hear uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, which are comprised of two psalms and the hymn of St. Justinian the Great. Now, the psalms in particular that we're singing at this point in the liturgy, we start with uh, Psalm 102, Bless the Lord, O my soul, um, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This is... uh, if, we're, if we keep with the theme of this portion of the liturgy being uh, St. John the Baptist and forerunner proclaiming Christ to us, mm-hmm. Psalm 102 is telling us uh, how we ought to worship Christ with oneness of heart, blessing the Lord uh, with all of our soul. And then Psalm 143 is proclaiming what kind of Messiah Christ is. If you recall, uh, trust ye not in princes and the sons of men and their salvation. During, during Psalm 145, as well as um, after, after these psalms, we sing, O Only Begotten Son, which was actually uh, composed by St. Justinian the Great, the, the emperor, a man of many talents, uh, where we, um, O Only Begotten Son and Word of God, Lord Immortal, where, uh, which is a profession of faith in the saving work of Christ, which, again, St. John the Forerunner prophesied upon seeing Christ. Now, at the end of the antiphons, we have uh, the little entrance, which, if we go back to that procession through Constantinople that we talked about uh, before, uh, is when the, the clergy and the people finally enter the church. And we can see this still today if you come to a hierarchical liturgy, uh, where the bishop starts sitting on his uh, chair, his cathedra outside the church, and then at the little entrance when we enter with the gospel is when the bishop uh, and the priest finally uh, come into the altar. In uh, Constantinople, before about the 7th or 8th century, this was um, this was the people coming in from walk, processing in the streets, singing psalms into the church. So the little entrance itself is the revelation of Christ to the world, or uh, his theophany, since the antiphons were uh, capturing what St. John the Baptist 
preaching to us about the coming of Christ, uh, the little entrance is his theophany. The priest and deacon, uh, priest, deacon, and servers, well, after having venerated the altar, the servers don't venerate the altar, but uh, pr we process out of the north door with the gospel book, symbolizing the good news when Christ began to preach. Now, um, as we, once the doors are open and we're preparing for this little entrance, the Beatitudes are sung as the clergy prepare for the entrance. Uh, which the Beatitudes, um, blessed, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the, 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 the meek, the pure in heart, uh, proclaim to us the path of Christian perfection. As uh, St. Peter of Damascus says, all the Beatitudes make God, man a God by grace. He becomes gentle, longs for righteousness, is charitable, dispassionate, a peacemaker, and endures every pain with joy out of love from God, and we should thank him greatly for them and the rewards promised. The kingdom of heaven in the age to be, spiritual refreshment in this world, the fullness of all God's blessings and mercies, this manifestation when we contemplate the hidden mysteries found in holy scriptures, holy scriptures will hear soon, and in all created things, and the great reward in heaven. For if we learn well on earth to imitate Christ and receive the blessedness inherent to each commandment, we shall be granted the highest good and the ultimate goal of our desire. As the apostle says, God, who dwells in unapproachable light, alone is blessed. We, for our part, have the duty of keeping the commandments, or rather being kept by them. But through God in his compassion, but through them God in his compassion will give to the believer rewards both in this world and the world to be. So having heard, having heard uh, the Beatitudes, or the commandments of Christ, uh, the gospel is brought out of the altar, Again, symbolizing Christ's epiphany or theophany, his revelation to the world. And uh, as, uh, then as we proceed back into the altar, uh, we sing to him, Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ, the Son of God, uh, as we are beholding the Lord through the gospel book, which contains his words. And St. Germanus uh, in On the Divine Liturgy says, The entrance of the gospel symbolizes signifies the coming of the Son of God in his entrance to the world. Now, after the little entrance, we hear the Traparia and Kentuckian, which are the hymns to the day. Uh, if uh, on Sundays we'll always hear a hymn to the resurrection, today we heard uh, hymns to St. Sabas. If you come during the week, there'll be um, hymns to the saint, saint of the day or hymns for the, uh, the weekday, depending on the rank of the feast. Uh, and while the Traparian and Kentuckian are being sung, uh, the priest is praying that the angelic hymn, the Trisagian hymn, that we'll, we will be singing shortly, will be said by the people in a manner pleasing to God. So uh, after the Traparian and Kentuckian, we have the, um, the deacon announces the singing of the Trisagian hymn. And we say... Um, O Lord, save the pious and hearken unto us. Um, the deacon says unto the ages. Uh, that's a, a blessing from the deacon and uh, announcing the singing of the Trisagian hymn. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. And so St. Germanus, uh, again, in On the Divine Liturgy, says, The Trisagian hymn is sung thus. There the angels say, there, meaning in heaven, the angels say, glory to God in the highest. Here, as in we on earth, like the Magi, we bring gifts to Christ, faith, hope, and love, like the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And like the bodiless host, we cry in faith, Holy God, that is our Father, Holy Mighty, that is the Son and Word. For he has bound the mighty devil and made him who had dominion over death powerless through the cross, and he has given us life by trampling on him. Holy Immortal, that is the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, through whom all creation is made alive and cries out, Have mercy on us. So while the Trisagian hymn is sung, the priest and deacon go to the high place uh, within the altar. Uh, under the icon of Christ, we have highest ascending into the darkness of God in preparation for the hearing of the Holy Gospel. The reader approaches the priest with the epistle book for a blessing and goes out into the nave. Now, before the epistle is read, uh, the reader announces the prokimenon, which is repeated by the choir. And the prokimenon is, um, uh, again, is a kind of um, 
prophecy of the coming of Christ, because we're about to hear Christ's words. Uh, the Berkimah is often taken from Psalms, which themselves are prophetic. So before, um, before we're going to hear Christ's words, in this case through the apostles, uh, we hear the prophecy of his coming. So the epistle reading, which is the teaching of the apostles, prepares us for the hearing of the gospel. It's our final ascent towards the summit of learning, which is the words of the Lord. And being um, the words of the Lord being the gospel, obviously, which is kind of the, the pinnacle of the uh, liturgy of the word, the section of liturgy we're discussing today. After the reading of the epistle, the reader pronounces the Alleluia, announcing that the Lord has come and has spoken to us in the flesh. Uh, and St. Germanus clarifies um, what Alleluia means. Uh, in Hebrew, Al means he comes, he appears. El means God. And Uya means praise and sing hymns to the living God. <laughs> Now, after, uh, after, the, after the end of the epistle readings, we have the gospel reading. St. Germanus again says, the gospel is the coming of God. When he has been seen by us, he is no longer speaking to us through a, a cloud and indistinctly, as he did to Moses, through thunder and lightning and trumpets, by a, by a voice, by darkness and fire on the mountain. Nor does he appear through dreams to the prophets, as we were hearing the prophecies before. But he appeared visibly as a true man. He was seen by us as a gentle and peaceful king who descended quietly like rain upon the fleece. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. Through him, the God and Father spoke to us face to face and not through riddles. So having prepared ourselves for the coming of Christ through um, the, the Psalms, prophecies, and then the epistle reading we heard before, we proclaim, glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, and listen attentively to the words of our Lord. So the, um, after, so the, gospel, is the, the gospel is the words of the Lord. So this is, again, the high point of the section of liturgy we're discussing, um, the, the, lit, the liturgy of the word which is partially why it's called uh, the liturgy of the, which is why it's called the liturgy of the word. But after the gospel, uh, we have, uh, after the gospel, this, this section is, is essentially done. We have the prayers for various needs. Um, in these days, we have uh, all of our prayers for Ukraine and all the people we know suffering there, uh, as well as you know, many other people. For, for various reasons. Praise for the catechumens and the command of the catechumens depart. And St. Germanus, again, uh, says the, cat the catechumens go out because they are uninitiated into the baptism of God and the mysteries of Christ. About the catechumens, the Lord says, and I have other sheep, I must bring them also, and they will heed my voice, so there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So as I, I briefly mentioned at the beginning, uh, the catechumens go out after this part of the liturgy. We don't typically do that today just because we don't have uh, the resources to catechize them separately during the liturgy, but God willing, we will uh, in the future. And uh, after the catechumens depart begins uh, the liturgy of the faithful, the next part of the liturgy, which uh, we, we will cover next week. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Questions? People? Anyone have questions about this right now? <laughs> so the, uh, because the catechism voted after the board, 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 so the, the deacon said, uh, "Catechumens, while you had to the to the Lord before they uh, before they left, they leave, right?" Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's a reason uh, behind that, right? What is the reason? I think what she's trying to ask is who is supposed to and not supposed yeah. to have means. <laughs> well, no. Because <laughs> that's a demand for a specific person. It was under the curve, you know. <laughs> so maybe you can answer that question. Who's supposed to bow their heads to the Lord when the when the when the deacon says catechumens bow your head to the Lord? Hmm. Well, if we, if we listen, if we listen to the deacon, then we would know that uh, it's the catechumens who are supposed to bow their heads. But see, this is the operative 
phrase if we listen to the deacon. So it's important that we, we do that because the deacon's ministry is to kind of bridge the gap between the altar and the nave. Right? He's constantly out between the altar and the nave. So when he's intoning uh, the Atenius, when he's raising his hand, it's like the wing of an angel that he's lifting with his, with his orarian. It's like the wing of an angel. And when he says, catechumens, by your hands unto the Lord, the catechumens should do it. But the people who are already initiated into the faith wouldn't do that. Is that the question you want to answer? Yeah, why? Because that's the one I want to ask. Yeah, why are they doing it? Oh, why, why do the catechumens, why are they commanded to bow their heads into the Lord before they depart? Or why are depart? we doing it? We before, 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 before they depart. <laughs> Uh, I, I would assume to, to pay their respects uh, and, and for practice because we should all be bowing our heads to the Lord often. It's the end of their it's the end of their worship for Sunday. Right? It's the end of their corporate worship with the entire church. At that point they go out and those who are initiated into the faith continue. Jake? I thought that it also it's like practical reasons so that there could be a practical thing to that, yes, that's possible. Uh, ideally, the subdeacons know who the catechumens are, but that's a good point. Jake? Yeah, Google Book is good, but it's not necessarily absolutely accurate. Uh, it's a little romantic, which is his era. And so you find a lot of kind of like romantic, nice stuff. Like it's a good book, but there are a few things that are. But that could have been something that people just did then. Of course, because there were no catechumens then. <laughs> Essentially, there were no catechumens. Talk to that. Just trying to get me. Almost got you, John. I know. Well, it's spoons. Out of control. Um, yeah. So the the at that time when Bogle wrote that, essentially there weren't any catechumens, right? The because children were baptized as infants. There were a few people who came as adults, but there was no like active catechumen like we have now. It's a good question, actually. But questions? Don't, don't you consider yourself all life being really kind of a catechumen? Well, that's what Google's talking about, that it's a, it's a question of humility. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's fine, but it seems to me that in our days, it's probably good for those of us who are initiated into the faith mm -hmm. to try to be a little more affirmative about that as, as a way to help the catechumens to learn. That, that, that's my two cents on that. If you mean, and then Julie wanted to say something. Uh, well, my, yeah. kind of like twofold of uh, like why it's called. Your husband said no compound questions, <laughs> right? Especially from his wife. I didn't want to tell you, he asked me to say it. <laughs> uh, like, why, why it's called the Liturgy of the Catechumens, and um, like which part is like dedicated? Is it only the part that's there with the that's dedicated to them, or? Like a greater portion, and why is it that? Why is more like what's dedicated to them? Why? Well, the the entire uh, the entire section I just discussed is called Liturgy of the Catechumens because it's the only it was historically the only part that catechumens were allowed to attend. It's also catechetical, and it, and it's yes, and it's catechetical. You get the uh, the epistle, you get the gospel. No, that was just part, part of part of the catechumens, oh, okay. but the catechumens. Only the initiated were able to be present in the church for the mysteries. The catechumens went out before the mysteries were, were, were served. And the, the church was very strict about that in ancient times. Uh, the catechumens were here until they were called to go, and then the subdeacons would put them out, lock the doors. Someone would go to catechize, then they would go and be educated, but the doors were locked and the, and the subdeacons kept guard so that no one who was not initiated into the faith could be present for the mysteries. They took it very seriously. So what, why is that? Because the mysteries are something very serious that we should also take very seriously ourselves, that we have the honor and uh, that we have the good fortune to be able to be here and to serve, uh, to be able to participate in, in the mysteries. Right? It was only two generations ago when they were still rounding people up and putting them in camps uh, in the Soviet Union for, for going to church. So, uh, and it looks like we might be going that way in Ukraine again, but that's, that's, yeah, which, that is, which is part of the reason they did it then, too. Persecution, just keeping things a little more secret. Basically, if you had an inquirer walk in who wasn't quite sure if they were sold, realized what was going on, and before them, the authorities, that entire church would be killed. Wow. So, they, they were shut, they were shutting everyone out 
to, to protect themselves. Yeah, especially during the ancient persecutions. Uh, we didn't get to Julia's question, and then we'll get to Henri. Some people, it's very useful to do the Jesus prayer. Um, we also pray for peace, the peace from above, during the actual prayers. Um, so, but I would not say that you should leave. I think that's a, it's just a temptation. Right? If, if we're here and we feel like we lost our peace, then we have to kind of redouble our efforts to regain that. Um, because, yeah, if we sort of create this rule for ourselves, well, I'll leave if I'm not in peace. We're going to be gone all the time, you know, and so it, we just have to, we have, that's one of those things we have to, we have to learn as Christians to fight. We have to learn to push. We have to learn to struggle. And we need God's help with that and we should ask it, but we also have to use what we've got to kind of push ourselves to do, to do right. That, that's why we have that repetition, constant repetition. There's never once, it's just one, two, three times at least, right? It's very important because for learning, kind of... especially. Mm -hmm. Yes. Henri, have you got a question? Okay. Uh, besides certain monarchic monasteries, are there any contemporary locations where one can expect the command for catechisms to depart to be enforced? Yeah, there are some parishes that do that. Probably the most famous one, just because he's all over the internet, is Father Josiah Trenum's parish in in, uh, in California. They have two liturgies. I believe they have two liturgies. I'm almost certain. And the priest who serves the first liturgy then catechizes the catechumen. So the catechumens only come to the second liturgy. Which is like at ten o'clock or something like that. And the priests who serve the first liturgy when they ask when the catechumens are called to depart, the priest brings them to the place where they'll be educated. There probably are others, but that's the one that comes to mind. I believe they also have a kind of a large rotating set of catechists. Other people. Who yeah, I'm sure it's not just that that's priest, well. but they do have. We've, we've talked about how we can do that. We just don't. It's not that we don't have the priests. We could do that. We don't have the facility. Where do we put them? There's nowhere to go now. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, when we have our our uh, school and hall taken care of, we could we could get serious about that. We probably would want to have one more priest. But in any case, it's something that we could we could look at more seriously when we have the facility to educate people. Because you don't want to turn them to the street. That's not getting sense. You know, catechumens get out of here. That's not the that's not the point of it. The point is to just transition from the educational part of the liturgy to a more sort of traditional education. Marina? What if they were just so, guests? Um, what if they were just guests? Well, we should try to catch them up with, with the catechumens, and then hopefully they'll be catechumens. <laughs> well, hopefully to uh, have the space for catechumens soon, we have to finish this school project. And this is the yummy way to um, finish it. You know, so, so when we finish the school, we'll go to the next project of church and place for reception. Excellent. Other questions? This is a good conversation. Anyone else have questions? There were a couple of things that Michael mentioned that I wanted to just point out some some sort of interesting pieces of that from at least from the time in Constantinople. It's, we have to admit that we don't know exactly how the liturgy went at Agia Sophia. We have a decent idea. But when you read St. Germanus, who, is, who wrote the, the best explanation of the liturgy there, you still can't understand exactly what's happening. It's obviously the chunks of the service are the same because we can see that, but there are different things that were going on. For instance, at the small entrance, there wasn't a procession from the altar to the altar, which is essentially what we're doing here, right? We pick up the gospel from the altar, we walk around, we put it back on the altar. In, in more ancient times, in Constantinople, for sure we know that at Hagia Sophia, there was a different building. That procession happened in a different building. It came from that building and into the church, right? And also, that was the time when the emperor entered as well. So that there were some kind of things going on there. We, that part we know, but every little piece we don't quite know. So it's good for us to, we have to be honest about that. 
the, the liturgy has been served for several thousand years, and we have a pretty good idea of what happened when the church came out of the catacombs. But as we go into the Byzantine time, some things kind of changed, and we're not exactly sure. For instance, the bishop's garment. The bishop used to wear what the priest wore, and they just put an on the forehead, uh, which, which was white, made out of wool for the lost sheep, on top of his shoulders. During the Byzantine uh, times, he took on the wearing of the sakos, which looks almost like a big deacon's vestment. Right? It, it's not like the priest vestment at all anymore. That was what the emperor wore. And, it, and over time, the Patriarch of Constantinople started to wear that, and then all, all the bishops started to wear it. So, But there was a time when, the, a long time in the church, maybe more than half the time of the, the church's existence, where the bishop wore a, a priest vestment and then just put a white amophorian on top of that part. I know for sure in that set of icons where St. Saba is for the three hierarchs, I believe also on this icon for three hierarchs, it's Basil, Greg, Gregory, Zay, Luke, and John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom is the only one wearing a sockless. The other two are wearing a Yes, historically, they definitely would not have had the sockless. In, in the 4th century, no way. I mean, St. John was the first one to start wearing it. Well, that could be. I yeah, gather he wearing sockless, which is why he's in an icon. Well, we can still think it. But you, you do find... Uh, I've seen a lot in Russia that uh, the bishops who are in more rural dioceses, they have these vestments like uh, they used to wear in the ancient church. It's much easier to put on for, for one person. So if you're going to some village to serve liturgy and you don't have subdeacons and deacons and stuff like that, it's just easier for the bishop to have something like that. So those are interestingly coming back into style. You can you can buy them now. It's, whereas you, you didn't see those for about a thousand years or 800 years. Other questions? Oh, yeah, I was saying something. I think that's everything that I had. Also, the great entrance was came from that other building also. I think just to follow up on what you said, Father, this, this shows a very important thing about uh, like tradition and how we, we are practicing the traditions that we received. We're not uh, kind of just going, studying and trying to reconstruct something that's old. Uh, we have a lot of ancient elements in our liturgy and in, in everything that we do, but it's this the tradition that we were handed. It's not uh, just something that we think is traditional that we're trying to do. I think that's a really important point because the Holy Spirit works in the church. The church is alive. We're not trying to have like the most authentic museum here. Right? We're 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 we learn from those who came before us, and we teach those who come after us. And that's the way that the church has always worked. But that, that, in that way, the Holy Spirit lives in the church. So what the vestments look like, it has no bearing on the faith, right? But the faith itself doesn't change. The external stuff changes. The way the choir sings, right? Probably you know that when St. Cyril and Methodius came to Russia, they were not singing for part harmony, right? It was not like that at all. It was much more like the Byzantine chant. Very simple, maybe one person, two people. Uh, and it was based on the folk tradition that was there, that they found. Over time, the Russian church transitioned into a four-part harmony. But that was actually a relatively late addition. That was Peter. Peter Peter the Great put, uh, in, uh, during his time, it became four-part harmony. But So that's quite late in the, in the life of the church. So those things change and it doesn't matter. That's not important. What's important is the content of the hymns. And no matter which church you go to, whether you go to the Greek church or the Serbian church or the Russian church or the Bulgarian church, the content is the same. How they sing it might be different, but the content is exactly the same, and that's what matters. Okay, yes, Yana. Questions. Uh, first, when uh, it's become a traditional to light up the candles in the church, in the temple? Yeah. And second of all, uh, when the choir sings, so we do not use any musical instrument, so why the other people is using it? Okay. Something we are very strict about? Or? Do um, you want to take a shot at those? I believe, well, I, I don't know exactly about the candles, but I think there were certain parts when uh, can't, certain candles should be lit. So um, candles, we can track that exactly the same song. He wrote in his Tipicon when you should light the lamps, how, even how you should light the lamps. So it means that it was happening before him because he received that. If you think about it, they were in caves. So that was probably a pretty ancient practice of the church the, the, because they were, when they were worshiping in catacombs and they were worshiping secretly, they didn't obviously have lights. So that was probably pretty early, but 
Saint Saba would have received that and then ca and captured that for us. So very early in the Christian time. What was the other question? All musical instruments. Yeah, which I'll, I'll probably just end up deferring to you on this. But my, under my understanding has been that um, it's almost, it's kind of the, it's related to what we were just talking about, about tradition and receiving what was given to us, that we never or maybe rarely used instruments. And so, uh, well, it is... It is true that the content is what's important. We also don't just kind of go changing things and just int introducing instruments um, that just because we think it would be cool because you know the content stays the same. We just we receive we've received um, no instruments. We receive vo only vocal music, uh, and that's what we do and we continue. What's interesting about this question is there's no no debate that in Solomon's temple they used instruments. Right, there's no question that in the temple in Jerusalem, they used instruments in their worship. The early Christians came out of that temple and continued the temple when they got kicked out. And I say they came out. That's kind of a euphemism of they showed them the door. Right? They got kicked out and they began to be persecuted, but they continued the temple worship. And our church, our church still reflects that architecture of the temple. Right? You have the Holy of Holies, which is the altar for us, you have the name, and you have the porch. I don't, that's exactly out of Solomon's temple. But they didn't use instruments anymore. When the, when, when the early Christians came out, as far as we can tell, they didn't use instruments. Why? It may be as sort of simple as they might not have had access to those things, right? It's not like they came into the trumpet store and bought a trumpet, right? Also, they were probably very expensive. And the guy who was the full-time trumpet player at Solomon's Temple probably didn't do a side gig with the Christians, right? Because the Christians were getting persecuted. So there, we don't know the answer exactly to that, why that was the case, but it could just be very practical stuff like that. Like, they would have done it, but there was nobody to do it. And they saw that as God's will, and were just like, okay, we'll go without it. Well, um, but if you think it's very, um, a lot more sounds come out, right? You can sing very... Um, quiet, right? And if you're hiding in the catechism, yes, yes, that's so another practical secret. aspect to it. If you're if you're trying to stay away from the Roman guards, having the trumpet guy go on full blast is probably not the best way to do that. So, uh, John, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question because you illustrated in my mind. Shh, hold on for a second. They're settling the question over here, John. Ladies, one second. Go ahead. Uh, a difference between the Eastern and Western Church because organs in the Western Church have played a very important role. They have. I, I, I'm just curious how that difference might have developed. It would be interesting to know. I would suppose, but this is this is a, this is just me guessing that they were introduced later on. The, 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 the early Christians involved. We have the music right? student. Uh, right. Yeah, I know. I see him there. I just want to pontificate for a second. I guess I'm not going to get uh, I just uh, for my final project in my musicology class uh, this semester, I actually chose to uh, write about his research. Um, how the hurdy gurdy in the Western Church eventually was used. Uh, or it became uh, during that was basically like substitute by the organ um, later on in their in their worship. And what we see is like pretty dirty before the schism. It was used. We don't really know how uh, that well. And then the organ was actually used before the schism, but not the turkey. Never the turkey. There's uh, lots of monasteries actually used it to help train the monks um, how to chant. Uh, but then during the liturgy, nobody played it. Um, or maybe sometimes someone would like, uh, you know, give the pitch. Yeah, give the pitch. And then it's not until, um, uh, you know, a few decades after the, the schism, um, and in some places a few centuries, that we finally start seeing um, the papist music uh, organs play in, like, actual play. So. Interesting. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Other questions? That's what's fun about being in St. Cloud Music. Yeah, any question you got, you, we, we've got, I can just make stuff up, or we actually have people that know the answer. Any other questions, folks? All right, Michael, thank you very much.
Uh, we'll have another lecture next Sunday. Please join us uh, during our meal, and we'll continue to discuss the divine liturgy. Thank, Thank you, my Father. Thank you, everyone.